Hello my friends, welcome once again. I am back after a few days break and in today's video I'm going to talk about something quite interesting, a thing that we normally do as a part of our bedside practice and that is how to interpret a urine dip. You, most of you would be familiar that this is a very common bedside procedure and we do it, it almost on a daily basis as far as our clinical practice is concerned. So it becomes very important for you guys to interpret the urine dip accurately because it helps you in diagnosis of so many things, especially uh, in context of UTI and especially when you are monitoring uh, kids who have got renal problems. So without further ado, let's dive in and get started. So the first thing is why we need to analyze a urine sample. As I told you, that it's a very common bedside procedure. Now, the reasons that we uh, need to analyze a um, urine sample is, first of all, a urine dip actually helps us in making a diagnosis of UTI. Now, remember that we do not make a sort of an accurate diagnosis of UTI solely on the base of urine dip because by definition, to diagnose UTI, you need to prove that there is presence of bacteria uh, on a sample of urine, which we call as culture sensitivity. Nevertheless, I mean, because it takes a few days, urine dip can help in the diagnosis because along with clinical features, if there is an evidence on a urine dip that it is leading towards UTI, so you can actually make a diagnosis of presumed UTI and you can start the treatment uh, before uh, you can send off the um, cultures and sensitivity and you obviously because you will have to wait for four or five days so you can start the treatment uh, while awaiting the results of the culture sensitivity so it helps in the diagnosis of uti number two it also helps us when we are dealing with children who have got febrile episodes without any localizing signs uh, without any localizing signs mean that they've got fever, but they do not have any focus of infection. So if you examine their throat, you don't find any focus of infection. You look into the ears, you look into their nose, that's fine. You auscultate their chest or you do chest x-ray, you don't find anything over there. You also look into the abdominal cause and you don't find anything over there. So we call it as a febrile episode without localizing signs. And a UTI or urinary tract infections could be one of the possible reasons for a child who's got a febrile episode without localizing signs. So as a part of our workup where we do blood tests and blood culture, we also start with a urine dip. So urine dip can help us in identifying if there is a cause in the renal system. So it helps us in diagnosing children who have got fever without localizing sign. Number three is that it helps us in what we call as uh, diagnosis of glomerular and tubular disorders. So glomerular and tubular disorders are basically renal disorders in which either the glomeruli or the uh, tubules, they are affected. So glomerular disorders, uh, the common one are glomerular nephritis, uh, nephrotic syndrome. Similarly, the tubular disorders are renal tubular acidosis and different types of tubulopathies. So it helps us in the diagnosis of these uh, glomerular disorders or tubulopathies. And for those children who have already been diagnosed, let's say with nephrotic syndrome or have been diagnosed, let's say with glomerulonephritis or autoimmune conditions in which the renal system is involved, like for example, systemic lupus erythematosus, uh, henoch's conlin purpura, and you are monitoring them over a period of time. So that monitoring, part of that monitoring would be examining their urine specimen every now and then, maybe on a weekly basis, maybe on a monthly basis. And you see, what is the degree of involvement of the kidneys in these diseases? So to monitor that, urine dip is a very simple and um, non-invasive, inexpensive technique to monitor the renal involvement in these types of disorders. So that's why we need to uh, do this, uh, you know, dipping of the urine sample. And that's how it helps us in like, you know, diagnosis of uh, different conditions and even monitoring them. Now, how do we interpret? So the first thing when you are doing a urine sample is that obviously you would uh, need a urine sample. Now, it's very important that this sample should be a clean catch. Remember, gone are the days when we would put wool like uh, cotton wool in the nappies because that leads to a lot of false positive results. So you need a clean catch. So normally you would give them a sterile pot 
and you will ask the parents to hold that sterile pot between their legs and massage their bellies or give them some fluids or give them some milk and uh, they wait till they are able to catch a clean sample. So basically you need a clean catch urine. If that is not possible for some reasons, then there are other methods like you can go for suprapubic aspiration or you can also do a quick catheter in to take a urine sample and catheter out. Uh, but nevertheless, as I said, clean most of the time we use the clean catch method. And in majority of the cases that actually helps like uh, you can get a clean catch maybe within a half an hour, an hour. So you need a clean catch sample for proper interpretation. Remember, if it is contaminated, then <clears throat> it would give you false results. And obviously, on the basis of false results, your treatment can go in another direction. <clears throat> so before you start dipping the urine, I mean, it's very simple. These days, you have got these urine dip uh, strips where you can just dip it in the urine and uh, on the box, they have got like different color codes and you can match the color codes to see what is the pH, what is the the degree of uh, glycosuria, what is the degree of proteinuria, so on and so forth. There are also automated machines in which you would put the same strip and then you uh, put it in the machine and that machine gives you a printed result. So depending on whatever facilities you have got in your practice, you can go for either one of these. But before that, it's very important that once you get a clean couch or you get a suprapubic um, aspirate, you have to look at the color. Now the color you have to look with your eyes. Obviously the machine does not interpret the color. It's your eyes and based on your knowledge you will interpret what does that color mean. So the normal color of uh, the urine sample, it depends on concentration. It depends how concentrated the urine is. So if the child has been drinking normally, uh, the most of the time the color would be, uh, it would be colorless or it might be light like pale straw colored. If the child has not been drinking well, then he would have a very concentrated urine and it would be quite dark yellow. So remember that the color uh, can vary from being colorless to pale yellow. Now, when you are looking at the color and if, if you seem like the color is very dark or the color is of any other color apart from normal, it's very important that you ask the parents or if the child is older, you ask the child if he has or she has been on any drugs because certain drugs, most of the drugs, they are metabolized by the kidney and they are excreted in the urine. So they will give some form of coloration to the urine. So you ask about drugs and certain drugs or dyes can also color the urine. So you would ask whether the child has been taking any medications like any antibiotics, uh, any paracetamol, um, multivitamins, or you ask them if he had uh, different types of foods which might give color like beets, uh, like beans, like sprouts, things like that. So some of the you know natural products they can also give color to the urine. So you ask about whether the child has been in taking and then you interpret the color in light of whatever the child has been taken. So usually if the child has got a dark yellow colored urine, that dark yellow colored urine is usually caused by uh, drugs, different types of drugs. So it could be paracetamol, it could be multivitamins, like uh, it could be antibiotics that the child has been taking on a regular basis. So because they are excreted in the urine, the urine would be a bit more dark yellow colored. Uh, if the urine is brown colored or cola colored, so if you feel like it is just like a cola, Pepsi Cola or Coca Cola, or it's got a brown uh, tinge to it, then uh, it can be caused either. Uh, because the child is taking certain drugs like nitrofurantoin. Nitrofurantoin is a drug which is used for UTI and it's also notorious to give brown discoloration to the urine or it can be caused by blood. Now blood is normally red. Blood, the blood coming up from high up in the renal system like somewhere coming from the level of the glomerulus from inside the kidneys by the time this blood goes down and reaches the bladder, spends some time in the bladder and then comes out and you get it in a, as a clean catch or a suprapubic aspirate, that would have changed color and it changes to a uh, brown or cola colored. So this usually type of blood coming up from the high up in the renal system is usually caused by glomerular disease like glomerulonephritis and glomerulonephritis has got different types. It could be um, IgA nephropathy, it could be post apteroccal glomerular nephritis, it could be mesangial, it could be um, uh, you know uh, other types of glomerulonephritis. But nevertheless, I mean whatever types of glomerulonephritis it is, 
uh, mild to moderate or sometimes severe glomerulonephritis would give like cola colored uh, discoloration to the uh, urine if it is fresh or just like there is a fresh blood in the uh, urine sample it could mean that the blood is coming from the a lower part of the urinary system so it's basically coming from the bladder or the urethra so in certain types of uh, conditions like uh, cystitis or if there is some growth uh, transitional cell carcinoma of the bladder sometimes even contaminants especially in girls who are menstruating so their menstrual blood can come because the openings are very close to one another so the blood trickling down the vagina can contaminate the urine sample and you can see fresh blood in that so it's important uh, that if you are uh, interpreting a red uh, colored urine sample you ask whether the, the girl if she's if she's adolescent girl if she's menstruating uh, so obviously but if it is blood that blood is coming somewhere from the lower part of the renal system if the um, urine colored is orange remember like orangish uh, yellow some of the drug like rifampicin which is a drug used for tuberculosis so tuberculosis is rare in you know, in uk but in many parts of the world uh, tb is highly prevalent so people coming from that part of the world or if you are practicing in that part of the world and these kids who are taking rifampicin most of the time their urine sample would be orange the other possibility of an orange colored uh, urine would be what we call as jaundice so uh, remember obstructive jaundice uh, can give orange tint to the um, urine so hepatic cause of jaundice like hepatitis uh, especially hepatitis a and e or uh, obstructive jaundice like if there is biliary obstruction because of any reason it might be a stone or it might be a tumor or might be any other form of obstructive jaundice that can also give rise to uh, orange discoloration of the urine so higher the degree of biliary obstruction um, higher would be the uh, orange discoloration of the urine and especially if you are confronted with an, uh, a urine sample which turns dark like it turns dark brown or black on standing so for example there is some time uh, you are busy you didn't get time to uh, dip the urine you are doing something else and you come back maybe if after 15 20 minutes and you see oh well when this uh, let's say the parent gave me the urine sample it was yellow or dark yellow and now it has changed color to like dark brown or black and that condition remember there is only one condition in which the urine on standing can change color to uh, dark brown because of uh, oxidation and that condition is known as alkaptonuria so alkaptonuria and alkaptonuria what happened there is homogentistic acid being released in the urine so that on standing gets oxidized and gives the black color so remember there's only one condition when this uh, it's, it's a metabolic condition we call it alkaptonuria okay uh, so that is one thing that you should keep in in, in your mind moving on now once you have dipped the urine sample either through strip like you know the manual method where you read it like by comparing the colors or you put it in the machine and the machine gives you a small like a um, a sip slip or a seat on which like all these numbers and you know uh, things are written then how to interpret now on a normal urine dip whether it's a strip method or some machine method there are a few things that you would be looking into so it gives you uh, number one specific gravity now specific gravity uh, depends on uh, the type of uh, method that you are using uh, some use uh, the you know the uh, what you call the range of 1.010 to 1.030 others say that it is 1.005 to 1.030 so this is the normal specific gravity range so if it is on the lower range let's say 1.005 or lower than that then it simply means it's a very diluted urine and if it is greater than uh, 1.030 it means it's a very concentrated urine so what does that mean a, a, a low specific gravity or a dilute urine could mean different things it just must, must might be a normal if the child has been drinking a lot of fluids so obviously that fluids are filtered and the urine would be diluted or uh, similarly if the child has not been drinking i mean uh, because he's unwell or he's got like sore throat or whatever for whatever reasons because of febrile illness or something he he's reluctant to take fluids and food so obviously the body tries to conserve fluids and in that case he would pass a very concentrated 
uh, urine that would have a high specific gravity. But other than that, there are certain pathological conditions in which you would be getting low specific gravity. For example, in uh, diabetes insipidus. Diabetes insipidus. Insipidus. So diabetes insipidus, which could be nephrogenic or cranial, or there's another form which we call a psychogenic polydipsia, where a child just because of psychological condition is just drinking water, water, water. So in that condition, the child would be passing uh, what you call uh, diluted urine. So remember diabetes insipidus, which can be nephrogenic, which can be cranial. Obviously, you cannot diagnose what type of diabetes it is. Like obviously, you need the water deprivation test then to diagnose diabetes insipidus. But it can give you a hint that diabetes insipidus might be the reason for this child's diluted urine. Similarly, concentrated urine, as I said, like it might be physiological if the child is not drinking enough or it might be caused by another condition which we call as SIADH that stands for Syndrome of Inappropriate Antidiuretic Hormone. Now, this is basically a condition in which a lot of antidiuretic hormone is produced by the posterior pituitary and it can happen in various conditions. <clears throat> It can happen in chest infections, in pneumonia and bronchiolitis. It can happen in CNS disorders, uh, so on and so forth. So what happens? A lot of antidiuretic hormone because it's antidiuresis. So um, what it would do is it would conserve the fluid inside. So the child would not be making enough urine and the urine would be very, very concentrated. So the specific gravity would rise. So these are the few things in which the specific gravity would either be low or would be high. And then the next thing that it checks for is the presence of glucose. Obviously, it's, it's, it's easy to interpret if glucose is coming in the urine. Normally, there should be no glucose filtered in the urine. So if the glucose is coming down and you see glucose positive on the urine dip, two meanings. Either the child is diabetic. So you have to check the blood sugar levels as well because with normal blood sugar levels, remember, the urine would not be showing any glucose. But yes, if the glucose levels goes up, hyperglycemia then some of that extra glucose would spill over from the kidneys into the urine and that would give you a positive urine dip for glucose but let's say you find that the glucose is positive and do you check then the blood glucose levels and the blood glucose levels are normal what does that mean because if the blood glucose levels are normal then the child is not diabetic but why then, if the blood glucose level is normal, why the glucose is getting filtered into the urine? That could mean a tubular disorder. Tubular disorder means that there is something wrong with the kidney tubules. So a different type of tubular disorders like Fanconi syndrome, uh, like renal tubular acidosis, type 1, type 2, type 4, like they can be associated with what we call as glycosuria and the glucose can filter into the urine it's not because the child is diabetic it's simply because there is damage to the tubules or the tubules renal tubules are not functioning properly the third thing is ph now the ph doesn't help much because the ph range is somewhere from 4 4.8 to 8.0 so there's a wide range i mean from acidic to alkaline so you can have like different ranges uh, of ph but remember uh, alkaline pH can be because of uh, various reasons certain drugs can cause alkaline pH similarly certain drugs can cause acidic pH then you can have like um, uh, renal tubular acidosis in which like the pH would be <clears throat> acidic and uh, similarly uh, you know uh, if somebody is having sodium bicarbonate as a therapy or something they can also pass uh, alkaline urine so it doesn't help much because as i told you there are so many different things which can change the ph so ph is the least helpful thing as far as the urine dip is concerned then coming down to the proteins so the proteins would be shown on a urine dip as like traces or one plus or two plus or three plus or four plus as well so remember normally in a child who is having fever they can have traces of uh, protein and it can go up to two plus so remember, that doesn't mean that there's something wrong with the kidneys. Remember, it's just because of the fever, sometimes because of the uh, exercise, if the child is doing heavy strenuous exercise 
or if he is exposed to extreme cold or he has got high fever like 39, 40, then a little bit of because uh, there is a vasodilatation in these conditions, a little bit of um, proteins they can filter out uh, from the uh, glomeruli into the renal tubules and then they can uh, you know uh, test positive on the urine dip. However, if it is heavy proteinuria, if it is 3 plus, then you have to check because that would be the nephrotic range proteinuria. So you have to see whether there is any damage to the glomeruli, whether there is a nephrotic syndrome or whether there is uh, glomerulonephritis. So you have then to uh, check for that as well. And there are other tests like, you know, which would help you whether this is a glomerulonephritis or whether this is a nephrotic range proteinuria and how to uh, deal with them. So remember but in most of the cases you would see kids who have got a fever with sore throat or one or two duration and you do their urine day because you just want to rule UTI you will see that the proteins would be traces one plus two plus this usually happens because of high fever and has got no real significance this you should keep in mind I mean you don't need to treat a child who's got a high fever he's got a sore throat or be sore throat and he's got a protein area of two plus so that is just because of the fever then uh, coming down so we have discussed pH proteins now ketones now ketones basically ketones are formed when uh, there is problem with glucose metabolism so you do not have gl enough glucose substrate or you cannot utilize that and that usually happens in diabetic ketoacidosis or it can also happen in starvation you know so diabetic ketoacidosis is obvious they would have high uh, blood ketones they would have ketonemia and if you have got ketones high ketone levels in the blood so obviously some of those ketones would get filtered into the urine and you'll get be getting ketones into the uh, urine uh, but many kids who are not diabetic they would especially if they got fever and they are vomiting and they are not taking enough fluid so what would happen because they're not taking enough fluid they're not taking enough substrate so obviously the alternative metabolic pathways they kick in so some ketones are formed and those ketones are spilled into the urine and those ketones they come positive so if a child is let's say vomiting so you would see probably would be having ketones of two plus or three plus um, in the urine then the fourth thing is blood so blood obviously if there is gross hematuria you can see it in the form of brown or in the form of red uh, colored urine sample but microscopic blood can also be picked up by urine dip so remember this blood can come from anywhere this blood can be a contaminant from vaginal blood in females especially adolescent females who are menstruating and you take a urine sample that would definitely show some blood in it is simply a contaminant so in certain conditions in which there is breakdown of myoglobin like the, the, the muscle part. So myoglobin breakdown can also give you positive uh, blood on the urine dip. Though it is not blood, but it is myoglobin, so it would test positive on the urine dip. So myoglobinuria can occur in crush injuries. Somebody had, uh, let's say, um, an accident, a road accident in which like, you know, he was run over by a car with like muscles or crushed. So they can have uh, myoglobinuria. So remember that myoglobinuria can also give you positive blood. So then that gets very important. If somebody has got blood positive, then you need to do a proper urine analysis, urine analysis with microscopy so that the same uh, cells are examined under the microscope to see whether these are RBCs or not. If, so if there is RBCs, this is proper blood. If there are no RBCs, then it's probably something else like myoglobin. So you have to, uh, if blood is positive, then you have to do urine analysis with microscopy. Fine, then coming down to the nitrites. Now, this is the most specific thing for UTI. So, if there are bacteria, especially, and also keep it in mind, that if nitrites are positive, we take it as a strong indicator of UTI. So, if it is positive, it definitely means that the child has got UTI. And obviously, you would double confirm it then by doing culture sensitivity of the urine sample. But if there is no, if the nitrites are uh, negative that does not rule out uh, UTI so it's got good specificity but it's got low sensitivity so a positive nitrite means UTI but negative nitrite does not rule out UTI why because certain bacteria certain bacteria like E. coli which is the most common bacterial cause of UTI 
that can reduce nitrites and that would give you positive test only. But many other pathogens like Klebsiella, like Pseudomonas, they, would not, they are not able to degrade nitrites, so they would not give you the positive result. Okay, so if it is positive, it simply means that yes, this is a UTI most probably caused by gram-negative bacteria like E. coli. But if it is negative, that does not rule out. You still need to do culture sensitivity because that is the gold standard for diagnosing UTI. You might get nitrite negative, but you may see that on culture sensitivity, there is bacterial load growth. The other thing is, for nitrites to be positive in the urine dip, remember, the urine needs to stay in the bladder for at least four hours. So four hours is important. Let's say if the child is quickly urinating, he passes urine every two to three hours, then the urine is not staying for enough time in the bladder so that nitrites are positive. So in that case, nitrite will be negative. So the child has got UTI. So remember, nitrites positive helps you in diagnosis of UTI, but negative nitrites does not rule out UTI. So that's why we say the gold standard for diagnosing UTI is culture sensitivity of the urine sample. That's why whenever we get a positive nitrite in the urine sample, we always send the urine specimen for culture sensitivity. Even if we are clinically suspecting UTI and the urine sample nitrites are negative, but let's say leukocytosterase is positive and the child has got like clinical symptomatology, which is suggestive of UTI then still you would send the urine specimen for culture sensitivity. So this you should keep it in mind. The last but not the least is uh, leukocyte esterase. Now, leukocyte esterase basically tells you if there are white blood cells in the urine sample or not. Normally there should be no white blood cells or even if there are, there should be just like on a high power field should be less than five. And if they are less than five, they would not give you leukocyte esterase positive on the urine dip. So if leukocyte esterase is positive, simply means white blood cells are coming. But this does not mean that white blood cells are synonymous with UTI. White blood cell can come up in a variety of conditions. Yes, if their leukocyte esterase is positive along with a positive nitrite, then it is highly suggestive of a UTI. But let's say nitrites are negative and uh, leukocyte esterase is positive. It can happen in a condition which we call as sterile pyuria. Sterile pyuria. Sterile means that there is no bacteria because nitrites are negative. Okay. And pyuria means that the white blood cells are coming in the urine. And this can happen in uh, different types of conditions. Like for example, it can happen in Kawasaki disease. It can happen in uh, generalized viral infections. It can um, happen in autoimmune conditions. So white blood cells can come, but obviously there is no bacteria like SLE and so, so on and so forth. So these are a few things that are there on the urine dip result sheet. And we look at these parameters and we make a decision. So I told you that you can make a presumptive diagnosis of UTI on the basis of a positive nitrites and positive leukocyte uh, esterase. You can look at uh, the presence of the blood to decide whether it's caused, whether it's a high febrile episode, which is causing this, or is this a nephrotic range proteinuria where you would then work up for nephrotic syndrome. You would also look at the blood to see if this is caused by glomerulonephritis. It's a contaminant. So that is how we interpret a urine dip uh, in the ward on the bedside. And that is how it helps us in our clinical practice on a day-to-day -day basis. So just to summarize, remember, it's important that you take a clean catch of urine sample. It's important before you dip, you look at the color because the color can give you uh, ideas of what's happening with the child. 
So you always ask whether the child has taken any drugs or any colored foods and after that you interpret the color. And then you uh, dip it with that strip, you put it in the machine and that gives you the results and then you interpret the results on the basis of uh, what do you what do you think about the specific gravity, whether you find any glucose in the urine sample or not, whether you find any proteins, ketones, bloods, nitrites, or leukocyte esters, and on the basis of that you make a decision. So that was all about how to interpret a urine sample or how to interpret a urine dip at the bedside. So I hope you have learned something from uh, this small lecture. And if you have learned and if you have liked this video, then uh, give me a thumbs up. And uh, also, if you haven't subscribed to my channel yet, then uh, what are you waiting for? Subscribe and also press the bell notification icon. So whenever I upload a new video, you get an instant uh, message that a video is there and you are able to watch it. Thank you very much for listening. Have a good day and bye-bye.